There's now less than a week to go until Euro 2020 gets underway in Rome, with Turkey taking on Italy in the opening game of the tournament. I've spent plenty of time talking about the players as part of our Euros build-up, but today is the turn of the managers. All 24 of them have the chance to seal their place in folklore, joining the likes of Helmut Schoen, Rinus Mikkels, and Vincenzo Del Bosque in the illustrious list of European Championship winning managers. It must be said that if you took the 20 or 30 best managers in world football, I don't think many of them would actually be employed in the international game. Whilst managing your national team is still an incredibly prestigious job, Europe's super clubs in particular now carry even greater allure than the biggest national teams in most cases, and are, generally speaking, able to offer even greater financial remuneration. That didn't used to be the case, and represents a seismic shift within the world of football over the last few decades. With that being said, there are still some excellent managers at Euro 2020, and before I attempt to rank them from worst to best, I should point out that I'm ranking them solely based upon their talents right now, and the views expressed are just my own. You will disagree in many instances. Joachim Löw, though, just as an example, I do not believe, is the manager that he was six or seven years ago. I am not ranking each manager based on their accomplishments or prior talents. Right, with that out of the way, here is how I would rank the 24 Euro 2020 managers from least to most talented at this moment in time, in my humble opinion. 24th, Rob Page. Let's be honest, no one expected Rob Page to be managing a national team at Euro 2020, not even himself. A former centre-back who played in all four tiers of the English Football League pyramid, having made 36 Premier League appearances whilst captaining Watford, Page won 41 caps for Wales during his playing days. Page moved into coaching in 2011 at Port Vale, where he later replaced Mickey Adams as the team's first team manager. He later replaced Chris Wilder at Northampton Town, but he was sacked following just six months in the job. Page was appointed as the Welsh under-21 team boss back in 2017, but he had to step in as interim manager of the senior team following Ryan Giggs' arrest last November. When Giggs was charged with assault last month, though still pleading innocent, it was announced that Page would manage Wales at Euro 2020. Inexperienced, but not lacking in ambition, Wales have won four of their six games under Page at the time of recording, but the real test will come on June 12th against Switzerland. And for now, I can only put them in 24th place. If Wales lose against Switzerland, you can pretty much guarantee that one of the commentators on the BBC or ITV will make a joke about him wanting to turn a page on that result ahead of Wales' next game. 23rd, Stefan Tarkovic. Slovakia boss Stefan Tarkovic is actually a pretty interesting character. There is just very little to go on when trying to assess his managerial talents. Born in the eastern Slovakian city of Preshov, whilst it was still part of Czechoslovakia, Tarkovic began his career with his local club Tatran Preshov, but he was forced to retire through injury at the age of only 24. He moved immediately into coaching with the Slovakia women's under-19 team, and he has been in coaching in some form or another for the last 24 years. Tarkovic spent five years as Slovakia's assistant coach, including at Euro 2016, but he replaced Pavel Hapal in the top job back in November. He fulfilled his mandate of qualifying for Euro 2020 with victories against Ireland and Northern Ireland. But as I say, there is very little tangible evidence upon which to judge his first team managerial capabilities just yet. 22nd, Andrei Shevchenko. From a couple of relatively obscure names to one that is very well known, Andrei Shevchenko was one of the greatest Eastern European footballers of all time and among the finest centre forwards of his generation. Ukraine's all time leading goal scorer, Shevchenko retired in 2012 and initially went into politics. His party only won 1.58% of the vote in the 2012 Ukrainian presidential elections though, so Shevchenko turned his attention to coaching. It's not unusual for national teams to appoint national team legends, and having turned down the chance to manage Ukraine in 2012, Shevchenko became the nation's assistant manager in 2016, before taking the top job later on that year. A pragmatic manager, Shevchenko isn't afraid to mix things up depending on Ukraine's opposition and you can expect him to try and spring one or two surprises at the Euros this summer. 21st, 
Joachim Löw. This is going to seem like a shockingly low ranking for Joachim Löw to some people, and in many respects, it is. The job that Löw has done with the German national team, building upon the foundations laid by his former boss Jörn Klinsmann in 2006, has been outstanding. You could see when Germany battered England at the 2010 World Cup that they were a national team going places. And sure enough, four years later, Löw guided Germany to the 2014 World Cup. So, make no mistake, Löw has been a phenomenal manager, and in terms of accomplishments, few managers in this video come close. However, I said I was ranking the Euro 2020 managers based on their current ability, and it is impossible to view Löw as anything other than a man in decline, at least in terms of the German national team. Following a horrendous 2018 World Cup, Germany finished bottom of their Nations League group and have recently lost 6-0 to Spain and 2-1 against North Macedonia. For that reason, Germany are priced at odds of 9-1 to to win Euro 2020, despite having one of the outstanding squads at the finals. Having said that, I did have a dream that they won the tournament at Wembley again, just like in 96, so who knows. 20th, Frank de Boer. A man who was described by Jose Mourinho as the worst manager in the history of the Premier League, Frank de Boer has had a pretty sketchy record since leaving Ajax in 2016. Whilst managing his former club, de Boer cultivated an excellent reputation for winning trophies whilst playing a vibrant, attractive style of football and promoting youth, which made him one of the most sought-after managers in all of Europe. Fairly disastrous and short-lived stints at Inter Milan and Crystal Palace followed before De Boer scurried off to the MLS with Atalanta United. He was handed a lifeline in Europe when his former teammate Ronald Koeman accepted a job at Barcelona and the KNVB selected him as his replacement. One suspects this job will be do or die for De Boer at the highest level, but the way in which the KNVB hire managers, he'll probably just have to wait for Dick Advocat and Gus Hiddink to be sacked, and he'll get appointed again. 19th, Gareth Southgate. Again, this might seem quite low, given that I have often defended Gareth Southgate from what I think has been a fair amount of undue criticism, I even made an entire video about it. To be clear, I still think calls for him to be sacked at any time over the last couple of years are ridiculous and way too premature but this tournament is huge for the England boss. Personally, I would love for him to be more ambitious and more expansive, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and if England can wangle their way to the final through corner routines and counter-attacks, no one will be complaining about the fact that we didn't get to see Jack Grealish and Phil Foden on the pitch at the same time. Well, that's a lie. This is England we're talking about. Of course there will be someone complaining, but you know what I mean. Whilst I think Southgate has largely done a pretty good job as England boss since replacing Sam Allardyce, his only club experience involved getting relegated and sacked at Middlesbrough, and I don't think he has yet done enough with England to justify finishing any higher in this list. If he wins the Euros, he can have top spot, a statue in Trafalgar Square, and I'll buy a dog, dress him in a waistcoat, and name him Gaz. 18th, Kasper Hulman. A man who may be familiar with some followers of the Bundesliga, and I'm delighted to say that we have a growing number of German subscribers at HITC7s, Kasper Hulman spent nine months managing Mainz in the 2014-15 season, where he replaced a certain Champions League winning boss named Thomas Tuchel. Hulman didn't enjoy Tuchel's success at Mainz, nor has he done so in general. A Danish Superliga title with Nordjylland in 2011-12, his only major piece of silverware to date. Hulman was due to take the reins as Denmark boss after Euro 2020, when Uga Hreider's contract expired, but the postponement of the finals means Hulman will manage Denmark at the tournament. His impressive record of 8 wins from his first 11 games has given Danes hope, and Denmark's punching above their weight since his appointment seals him a spot in 18th. 17th, Marco Rossi. I must admit that everyone around this point in this list seems to be too low but that's a reflection of some really talented bosses managing at this summer's Euros. I have followed Hungary's rise, not religiously, but with a keen interest in recent years, and I have to say Marco Rossi appears to have done a fine job from what I have seen. A vastly experienced manager who made his name in the Italian lower league game before winning a top flight title in Hungary with Budapest Honvéd, he exceeded even the most ambitious of Hungarian football fans' expectations by qualifying for Euro 2020 and winning promotion to the top flight of the Nations League. 
Hungary have been drawn in a bitterly tough group of death against Portugal, Germany, and France. But if by some miracle they can emerge from that group, they will have no one to fear going forward. 16th, Franco Foda. Another man with an Italian sounding name managing a national team other than Italy at Euro 2020, Franco Foda is actually German, but his father was of Italian descent, hence the name. Foda won a couple of caps for West Germany back in the 1980s before moving to Austria, where he won two league titles with Sturmgras. Foda has since had three separate stints managing the club, in addition to spending a single season managing another one of his former clubs, FC Kaiserslautern, where he was sacked. Put frankly, Foda's pre-Austria appointment in 2018 is not particularly impressive in international terms, but he has worked wonders in his three and a half years with the national team. Austria have won 20 of his 32 games in charge, including victories against Russia, Germany, and Sweden. 15th, Yaroslav Shilhavy. The Czech Republic, or Czechia, have obviously been drawn in the same group as England a Euro 2020, and they may prove to be tricky customers for Gareth Southgate's side should the three Lions fail to grab an early goal. There's no doubt that the Czech Republic have a handful of really decent players, but they're also a really well-drilled outfit under Yaroslav Shilhavy, who has won 14 of his 25 games in charge of the national team. A fantastic man-manager who is adored by his players, Shilhavy is a fairly defensive-minded coach, a former defender himself, who looks to hit teams on the break with quick, incisive counter-attacks. Czechia famously beat England back in 2019 in Euro 2020 qualifying, and they also recently drew against Belgium, who topped the FIFA World Rankings. 14th, Paolo Sousa. A more familiar face to English viewers, Paolo Sousa managed Swansea City, Leicester City, and Queen's Park Rangers a little over a decade ago. A brilliant defence midfielder and captain who read the game well, Sousa always seemed destined for a career in management. He has won league titles in Israel and Switzerland, he has managed both Fiorentina and Bordeaux, and even found time for a quick pension-boosting stint in the Chinese Super League. Sousa was appointed as Poland boss earlier this year following the dismissal of Jerzy Branczyk, who had guided Poland to Euro 2020 qualification. One of a growing contingent of Euro 2020 managers, who seems likely to operate with a back five or back three, depending upon your interpretation at the tournament, Sousa is renowned for his flexibility, and it looks as though he will try to build his team around Poland's star man, Robert Lewandowski. 13th, Stanislav Cherchesov. I just realised how long this video is going to be if I didn't speed it up a bit, so my apologies if I become a little bit more terse with the biographies and descriptions from this point on. Stanislav Cherchesov is the Russia manager, and he has occupied that position since replacing Leonid Slutsky after Euro 2016. Russia have made marked improvements on his watch, reaching the quarterfinals of the 2018 World Cup, and the former Soviet goalkeeper will look to play high-pressing, direct, and disciplined football at this summer's finals. 12th, Jana Andersson. Marking the midway point in this list, and reflecting the fact that I best hurry up, is Sweden boss Jana Andersson. A man who has never managed outside of Sweden, Andersson made his name with Halmstad, where he knocked Sporting Club de Portugal out of the UEFA Cup, before guiding Norrköping to their first Swedish championship in 26 years. A diligent manager with fantastic attention to detail, Andersson doesn't suffer fools gladly, and is famous for his blunt responses to journalists and press officials. Sweden will be well drilled, organised, and everyone will know their roles well, just as they did in 2018 at this summer's Euros. And if they had a little bit more magic and a few more goals in their side, you might fancy them as outsiders. 11th, Steve Clark. As much as I disagree with Steve Clark's decision to leave Ryan Gold out of his squad, and yes, I still won't shut up about that, I do still think that he is a very good manager. He did a phenomenal job at Kilmarnock, and guiding Scotland to their first major tournament since the 1998 World Cup is not to be sniffed at. Scotland will spring few surprises at the Euros, from a tactical perspective, as Clark utilises a back three and a packed midfield in order to get his two outstanding left-backs and three of his talented midfield options onto the pitch at the same time. 10th, Marku Kaneva. Steve Clark may have overseen Scotland's qualification for their first major finals since 1998, but Marku Kaneva 
Mass demanded Finland's qualification for their first ever tournament. Of course, both achievements are partially because these tournaments keep being expanded by FIFA and UEFA for financial gain, but we'll gloss over that fact for now. Finland legend Marku Kaneva has been part of the Finnish national team setup since 2004, having gone from the under 21s to assistant manager and finally to head coach. Kaneva has done a magnificent job since being promoted to that job in 2016 with a win percentage of over 55%. His predecessor, just for some context, had a win percentage of 0%. No, seriously, during his 13 games in charge, Finland drew 3 and lost 10. So, that puts Kaneva's transformation of the Finnish national team into some perspective. Kaneva has made Finland tough to beat, dangerous on the break, and a real threat from set pieces. And for that reason, he deserves to start the countdown of our top 10. 9th, Zlatko Dalic. One of the best-known names and faces in European management, Zlatko Dalic has been the Croatia boss since 2017. His route to the top job was a bit unusual, having been appointed following seven years managing in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The HNS were vindicated in their decision to appoint Dalic in 2018, though, when Croatia finished as runners-up in Russia at the 2018 World Cup, and they will be expected to at least reach the knockout stages at Euro 2020 as well. Pragmatic in terms of his approach to games, Dalic's teams tend to press high and be comfortable in possession, something which is particularly true of his Croatia team, given their wealth of talent in midfield. 8th, Roberto Martinez. I think Roberto Martinez is a pretty underrated manager, and I was actually quite taken aback by the amount of backlash from Spurs fans when he was linked with a move to North London. Martinez has won more major trophies than Maurizio Pochettino, and whilst I wouldn't want to make a direct comparison since I'm also a big fan of Poch, it is worth pointing out that Martinez won his major trophy whilst managing Wigan Athletic. Since becoming the Belgian boss back in 2016, Martinez has a win percentage of almost 80%, and if they had avoided France at the 2018 World Cup, I think they would have won it. The former Everton boss loves to play a back three slash back five. He likes his teams to play on the front foot, but they are also really incisive on the counter-attack. I like Martinez, and I don't understand some of the criticism of him, so he takes eighth. Seventh, Chenel Ganesh. The oldest manager at Euro 2020, having just turned 69, Chenel Ganesh may be experienced, but he certainly isn't lacking in fresh new ideas. Ganesh is the man who guided Turkey to the semi-finals of the 2002 World Cup almost 20 years ago, and since then, he has won a couple of league titles with Besiktas. Never afraid to switch things up, it looks likely that Ganesh will go with a 4-1-4-1 formation at the finals, though he has already promised to quote, cause confusion. A disciplinarian who is nonetheless still loved by his troops, Ganesh has cultivated a familial relationship within the Turkey squad and a siege mentality towards others, and it is that attitude that has seen Turkey lose just three of their 25 games under him since he was appointed in February 2019. Sixth, Vladimir Petkovic. Switzerland have been drawn in Group A alongside Turkey at Euro 2020, meaning two of the tournament's best managers will face off during the group stages, if you're to take my word for it. And there is absolutely no reason why you should. Vladimir Petkovic is a Bosnian-born refugee and a naturalised Swiss citizen. Vastly experienced, Petkovic won the Coppa Italia whilst managing Lazio, but he was sacked by the club for agreeing to a pre-contract agreement with the Swiss FA over managing the national team, and the legal dispute surrounding that dismissal from 2014 is still ongoing. Switzerland are fairly flexible under Petkovic, who has lost just 18 times from 72 games since his appointment in 2014, reaching the knockout stages of both Euro 2016 and the 2018 World Cup, and the semi-finals of the inaugural UEFA Nations League Finals. Fifth, Igor Angolovsky. Without doubt one of the least well-known managers at Euro 2020, if not the least well-known, Igor Angolovsky's only managerial experience is two years with the team in North Macedonia, a stint as North Macedonia's assistant manager, and six years in the top job. Nonetheless, I think a case could be made for him having done the most impressive job in his current position of any manager at Euro 2020. 
Angolovski has lost just 16 out of a possible 49 games since stepping into the hot seat with North Macedonia as a very young manager in October 2015. He has won 50% of his games in charge of the national team, compared to records of 0% and 17% from his two predecessors. He has guided the young North Macedonia national team to their first ever major tournament, and they even beat Germany in a World Cup qualifier a few months ago. North Macedonia will need a miracle to get out of the group stage at Euro 2020, but they couldn't be in much more capable hands than those of Igor Angolovsky. Fourth, Fernando Santos. The only manager at Euro 2020 who has actually won the Euros in the past, Portugal are the reigning European champions we ought not forget, having been guided to glory in somewhat unusual circumstances by Fernando Santos in 2016. No spring chicken, Santos is 66 years old and has been in management since the late 1980s. He was a bit of an early man prior to 2016, having done a decent job at a string of Portuguese and Greek clubs without actually lifting too many major trophies. Just one league title, in fact. The Portugal squad is one which is laced with quality, but Santos's first thought is often on their system, solidity, and fitness. His teams are always packed full of energy, with standards set high in terms of effort and application, and Portugal are no exception. Whilst Portugal's neighbours, Spain, are the only national team to have ever recorded back-to-back -back European crowns, I actually think the current Portugal squad is stronger than the team that won in 2016, and there's no reason why Santos' side won't be in the mix this time around as well. Third, Luis Enrique. Speaking of Spain, next up is the manager of the Spanish national team. Capped 62 times by Spain over a period of nine years during his playing days, Luis Enrique belongs to a rare group of players who have played for both Barcelona and Real Madrid. In management, his greatest success came with Barcelona, where he won nine trophies in three years. Since being appointed as Spain boss, twice in some respects, having taken a leave of absence in 2019, Enrique has only lost three of his 21 games in charge. Enrique sprung one or two surprises with his squad selection for the Euros, but he is without doubt one of the most accomplished and talented managers on the international stage right now. Second, Roberto Mancini. No manager at Euro 2020 has achieved more within the club game than Roberto Mancini, a three-time Scudetto winner at Inter Milan, and the man who guided Manchester City to their first top-flight league title since the 1960s. Mancini inherited an Italian squad that was in disarray, having failed to qualify for the 2018 World Cup, but also one which had some excellent young talent coming through. The experienced former Sampdoria star has handled that transition period well, and no team won more points in Euro 2020 qualifying than Italy, who enjoyed a perfect record of 10 wins from 10 games. He will almost certainly set Italy up playing a 4-3-3 formation this summer, and whilst there may not be as many superstars in this Italy squad as there have been in previous generations, it would take a brave man to write them off before a ball has been kicked. First, Didier Deschamps. I suspect most of you knew what was coming in top spot, by process of elimination if nothing else, but I think Didier Deschamps is a worthy winner. An outstanding leader and reader of the game during his playing days, Deschamps has carried those skills over into management with great aplomb. A Ligue 1 title winner with Marseille 11 years ago, Deschamps was appointed as France's new head coach following Euro 2012. Le Bleu had endured a tricky few tournaments prior to his appointment, though they were also about to receive the finest influx of talent of any national team on the planet. In that sense, you could say that he has been fortunate, and you would be right, but someone still had to string all of that talent together. Deschamps is not a particularly expansive manager. He likes fullbacks who can defend, a solid centre-back partnership, plenty of energy in midfield, a big man up front who can hold the ball up and bring others into the game, and searing pace, able to make runs beyond him. You might say that France could afford to be more ambitious, but their pace and dynamism under Deschamps has made them the most consistent national team on the planet, reaching the final of Euro 2016, before winning the 2018 World Cup. And for that, the so-called water carrier deserves an immense amount of credit. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video, it means a lot, apparently it helps with the algorithm. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. 
You can also find me on social media, uh, on either Twitter or Instagram by the username at HITC7s. And there should also be a couple of videos recommended for you on your screen now that I thought you might enjoy, should you wish to click on them. Don't worry if not. Cheers. <laughs>